Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome to Night Light, everybody. First, first, I have to thank Ken Quiethawk for his amazing intro. He's a native storyteller, and he has been doing it forever. And if you have never experienced um, native story storytelling, um, do search search him out on on the internet. Um, the the Native American first people, whatever their term is these days, have a wonderful way of preserving preserving their cosmology and their history and their wisdoms, and they do it in telling stories that can be passed generation to generation uh, around the campfire. And it's a better way of preserving history, I think, than, than books that get boring. So check it out. Get enlightened a little bit and learn a little bit about how they preserve their history, probably better than we do ours, to be honest with you. And my guest tonight is Reverend Daniel Chesbro, and I'm very excited He's written a book called Tom Sawyer, Modern Day Messenger from God. And it's an amazing book, um, and it, it's, it speaks to you in, in unique ways. In the early evening of May 23, 1978, while making repairs under his pickup truck full of firewood, the heavy truck crashed down on Tom Sawyer, crushing his chest flat. A 33-year-old Olympic-trained bike racer and mechanic, he was clinically dead. Fifteen minutes later, he came back to life, recounting his strange experience of going through a tunnel, having his life review, and meeting the light. Spiritually energized by his experience and endowed with supernatural abilities, Tom demonstrated repeatedly that the reality we believe in is an illusion. The walls are not necessarily barriers, of your health and challenges can be healed in a moment, and it's possible to walk on water. During his death experience, Tom was charged by God with a three-part mission, teach the death, that death does not exist, prevent nuclear war, and promote the order of Melchizedek, in which he had become a highly respected teacher. Through more than 160 remarkable stories, Reverend Daniel Chesborough and Reverend James B. Eckerson share Tom's profound and enlightening insights on life, death, and unconditional love. The most complete and in-depth account of the life and teachings of Tom Sawyer, this book reveals Tom as a modern-day messenger of God who returned to life a powerful conduit of unconditional love, compelled to create positive change for humanity. Reverend Chesbro combines sensitive, intuitive abilities with a ministerial background, psychological training, and metaphysical knowledge to teach, guide, and enhance the lives of those he encounters. A dynamic lecturer and teacher, he encourages others to achieve self-love, self-confidence, balance, and the pursuit of their own high spiritual self. He's an American Baptist minister who trained at Andover Newton Theological School, Crozer Seminary, and Colgator Divinity School. Probably mispronounced that. This, this, this interview is very, very special to me. 
you all know, there's my southern part coming out, <clears throat> all of you know that I've been in this field for over half a century. How much over? Forget. But I've been here for a long time. And I was, I was following a pathway. I felt that there was something that I needed to do, and for 20-some years I, I piddled along. But in 1996, I was ordained by Reverend Chesbro in the priesthood of Melchizedek. And that set me on a journey that, that was, has and continues to be the most profound journey I could ever imagine. In 2007, the website got done and has been a place where spiritual teachings are um, constantly being put up. And in 2009, blog, this Blog Talk radio show started and it continues today to evolve into a place where I can put and, and a platform that I can provide for people who have different philosophies, thoughts, insights, but all having a, a metaphysical, a spiritual hint to them. Um, and so I, I am so delighted to be able to have Daniel on the show tonight. Um, and I have to tell you, it is, it is a great honor and a privilege, and I am just tickled pink to welcome uh, Reverend Daniel Chesbro to Nightlight Radio. Welcome to the show. <laughs> oh, thank you. Who is that guy you described? <laughs> you Isn't know, he wonderful? <laughs> I, I was somewhere him. out in the Midwest or upper Midwest, and they was doing this introduction, and it went on and on and on with all these things that... I had accomplished or something. I thought, oh, my God, how did I ever get all that done in one lifetime? <laughs> well, you oh, know, well. Um, spirit does move you, and it, it gives you the energy, and it really is yeah. amazing that that when you when you click into that energy, when you discover it within yourself, magic happens and synchronicities happen. And sure does, it yeah. Just, it blows you away. <laughs> and... And, and you know, I know in 86 you started the priesthood of, of Melchizedek. Yeah. Um, and and it's, um, it is it is in itself a magical experience. And yeah. um, I, I have to admit that I, I sat through, you know, the, the precursor to it, and I kept thinking, my gosh, he's talking my philosophy. Isn't this cool? <laughs> and, you know, I was all excited about it. And, and then when it came to the ordinations, um, you know, th there was a break, and then we, we did the, you did the ordinations. And <clears throat> I was impressed to start with, but when you put your hand on my head, my body felt like I had an electrical shock. Yeah, and yeah. it suddenly it, it suddenly went from oh isn't this cool to whoa there's something special here. <laughs> and right. <laughs> it, it went for what a great way to spend a weekend to I just did something that is profound. You know? <laughs> <laughs> there was one fellow uh, I can't recall his name right now unfortunately a very famous writer who brought his wife to be ordained and he was not intending to do it. And But at the last minute, he filled out a form, and he sat in the chair, and he got ordained. And then I didn't see him afterwards, and I thought, oh, gosh, maybe he's upset or something. I don't know. Well, he was scheduled to return to do a, a conference uh, lecture for us, and he's notorious for not teaching what you hired him to teach, you know. But he showed up, and he said, well, I'm supposed to be teaching you about whatever, but I have to tell you first about what happened to me when I was ordained. And I go, oh, here we go. Well, he went on to talk about the fact that when he had the experience like yours, that it felt like a mighty river had flowed through his body, and he was just so overcome. Yeah. And he ended up sleeping for two or three days. It just it did a lot for him in that amount of time, yeah, and uh, totally changed where he was going. Uh, most of the emails that I get during the week here are from people who've been ordained for many years or whatever, and they all tell me the same thing, how much their life has been totally transformed or they went to a whole new direction uh, after the ceremony. So it has very incredibly powerful energies, you know, that, that uh, happen to them. 
And uh, Tom Sawyer was here one night when his wife was ordained. And um, he said to me, he said, hey, kid, you know, you're playing with fire. <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, she was uh, ro- was Roman Catholic and uh, I think first or second generation Italian, you know. And um, she went to church the next day. And the priest got up into the pulpit and he said, well, today we're going to be discussing the order of Melchizedek. And she nearly fell over, you know. And <laughs> she went home and she said, Tom, this is real. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah. It, it it definitely is. And I think what, what has um, impressed me over the years is that uh, I, I, I have learned to, to wait for the call, to wait for something to happen even though sometimes i i I, my ego gets in the way and then i get in trouble but but for the (laughs) most part if i basically just wait things Mm -hmm. unfold so magically that that it that it's just it's it's unbelievable and it's like you know it's a it's a an it's an unconditional belief that if i get out of the way my spirit and God will take me where I need to be. Yeah, definitely. And you know, I and and yeah, it. Mhm. It 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 seems to me that that you know I I know you must I mean the number of people you have ordained have to right. be. Un- it's, it's approaching sixteen thousand. Wow! I thought it would have been millions, really. <laughs> Well, probably because they talk to other people, you know, how it spreads. But actual physical ordination heading towards 16,000. But, uh, you know, one time Tom called me and he said, you know, um, we have priests in every major continent on the planet right now, and they're all doing phenomenal work because they're free. You know, you don't answer mm-hmm. to me. You don't answer to a doctrine or a dogma. You, It's your relationship with you and whatever your God is to you and the service that you're willing to commit to. So he said, you know, if both you and I died right now, we've done our work. But he said, you're going to live to be an old man, and I don't envy all you have yet to do. And I had written any books yet, and I'm 78 now, almost 79. And I consider this being approaching, you know, the, the old age. In fact, I was talking to my editor last night, and he said, well, what you have is a case of OLDS. I said, what? He said, old, Dan, old. <laughs> I well, said, yeah, I'm this is too, a severe case of holes. But it doesn't feel like it. And, you know, it, it's just been a joy. And I've not advertised or anything. It's all word of mouth. But people have had mm-hmm. dreams about it. Um, you know, a, a lady in Africa, when she was quite young, um, had a, a medicine woman as a teacher. And the teacher said to her, at some point you'll be going to the United States because you have to be ordained into the Order of Melchizedek. And then didn't explain it. And then the day came, well, the woman met a a fellow, and and she got married, the young woman. And she said, uh, but at some point we've got to go to America. And he said, well, I love you, I'll do anything. Well, the time came that she had to go to America, so she told him, and he said, goodbye. So (laughs) she left her husband and was taken to the airport by her teacher. And teacher said, don't forget the order of Melchizedek, goodbye. And she landed in Washington, D.C., and um, she met a, an Episcopalian uh, priest at the time. Now, they had begun ordaining women, so this was, you know, not that long ago. And um, he said, well, maybe you should be coming uh, into the Episcopal Church. He said, that just is, it doesn't feel right for some reason, you know. Well, she uh, found an article that was written about me in some old magazine somewhere at a New Age bookstore in, in Washington. And so she called my house and spoke to uh, my former wife, Carol. And Carol said, well, he's in Virginia right now holding a class for ordinations and all that. And she said, oh, where? And she told her. And then my ex called me, and she said, uh, this woman is coming to see you. And uh, and I think, you know, she's uh, rather excitable or something like that. Anyway, you know, I didn't know what to expect. Like, gee, did they let her out for the weekend, and she's going to find me, you know. <laughs> So anyway, there was a knock on the door in the middle of our class in the workshop, and she came in, and she saw me, and she screamed, and she ran to me and got on my feet and cried. And she said, can I wash your feet? Like, Barbara, what do you say to that, right? And the people were just, (laughs) 
right. They were all watching, like, what's going on here? She said, no, you don't understand. He's my teacher. And he comes to me in my dreams, and he has since I was a little girl. And he's taught me how to teach with healing and color and all that kind of stuff. And um, and, and uh, she said, uh, you know, it, it's been incredible to finally get to meet him. Well, she got ordained, and she sent many people, you know, into the order since then. But the kicker of the whole thing was, Barbara, I wasn't even born yet. Oh, you I know. Of course. So that that was an amazing event, and she's still working down in the D.C. area, and uh, doing marvelous work. Yeah, incredible work. So that's that's well, one story. Is. There's been so many. Yeah. Yeah, magic does happen, and and it does. Mm-hmm. It just you know keeping keeping track of it lets the universe know that you're paying attention, and then more and more comes your way. So it's mm-hmm. it's really kind of cool. Um, I know a lot of people probably have seen the title of your book and are wondering where's Becky Thatcher. Um, right. So let's... <laughs> That's you know when when I first met him. Um, I was living here at the at, down at the farm in upstate New York, and the phone rang, and uh-huh. my business manager said, "Would you like to know who's going to be on the show this week?" And I said, "Oh, who do you have?" She said, "We have Tom Sawyer," and I laughed, and I said, "Oh, and Becky Thatcher and Huckleberry Finn." She said, "No, no, no. He had a near death experience. You've read Raymond Moody, Life After Life. Well, it was kind of like yeah. that." I said, "Oh, okay." You know, and uh, shortly after that is when we first met. And what? I, I know that that he it wasn't a near death experience. He died. No, it was not. It was not. That, that that's a bit of a misnomer on the on the cover of the book, because it talks about. Let me see. I've, I've got it right in front of me. It says uh, his extraordinary life and near death experiences. Well, Barbara, he never had a near death experience, because twice he died, totally, and then came back. Uh, the first time was when he was crushed to death under the truck. For 15 minutes, you know, and um, mm-hmm. he was he was gone. A baby couldn't have survived that kind of a crash. I mean, that uh, thing with the truck. And um, then uh, the second time he was having back surgery, and I was told to go to sit on top of a mountain and pray for him and hold his energy so that, you know, he could stay here. And mm-hmm. uh, I hadn't said a word to anybody about that. And um, so the plane landed. I was told this on an airplane and uh, i was staying with the lady who wrote the book about him about tom sawyer and um and uh, she said would you like to talk to tom or something like that so he said to me uh yes to all that you were told in the plane but don't tell anybody what you're going to do we can't have any interference and so you know i the next day i went to the top of the mountain i found it first i got lost it was raining i found it and i sat up on this uh, boulder that had been spray painted with a star on it like x marks the spot sit here because months before he had sat there and looked at this beautiful valley and it was just like he had seen so i i sat there and that was already when he was in surgery they just uh, put uh, anesthesia into him and uh then he flatlined so i got off the the boulder and i went and clung to the top of the mountain to get more energy and there were four angels protecting the four directions in the operating room and I put gold and blue light into the incision and whatnot and and was singing and uh then his his vitals returned and they said well you can go now he's going to be fine well you know you go through this and, and you think well I must be mad after all I mean come on you know so but n- nobody knew what I had done and I got back home to the to the place where I was staying, and uh, the woman said, well, let's call and see how he's doing from post-surgery. So his uh, wife answered the call, and she said, well, he's doing well, but he came to and he said the strangest thing. He said, I was with uh, I was with Dan. It was No, he said it was beautiful. I was with Dan on top of the mountain, but why'd the son of a bitch move? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And there's been several well, I, of those kind of things, yeah. I think there's there's a couple of things that that most people think of when they think of someone getting total awareness, total um, total knowledge. Um, <clears throat> they they always think, you know, it's got to be somebody who is well educated and very prosperous, and that they get these, mm-hmm. you know, that these are the kind of people that ascend. To this level, and the reality it is that that 
no, it's absolutely normal people. Um, right. He wasn't. He wasn't doing anything. I don't believe spiritual before the truck fell no. on him. No, no, he didn't even and believe in God when he died the first time. So you know, Jesus that was a fairy a big tale. Surprise. You know, yeah, yeah, and he was a totally different blue collar uh, worker and worked in uh, road repair and all that in upstate New York. And you know, when when he died the first time, the first thing he saw. Uh, at, when he when he became uh, well, he went unconscious. He said, "Dan, it was like I I woke up from a dream when, when I died, and mm-hmm. but everything was totally black." And and um, people who go through that with a near death think that they're if they've gone to hell because it's just blackness all around them. But basically, that is pure love. That's pure God before God imagined light. Then comes the point of light. Then comes the tunnel, and that was his experience. So he didn't realize that he was within God when he first uh, woke up on the other side and uh, until the point of light showed up, and then he said, basically, oh, there is a God. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, then he had a high school education and mm-hmm. not a, a big scholar, but, you know, he did well, and he was a trained Olympic athlete. He was a bike racer. So he had some some interesting attributes, but certainly nothing of the spiritual vein, you know, the things that like I'd gone through. So it was a, a total a switch for him to come back and then espouse that. You know, one of the things that he did before he died was um, he would rough up his wife on occasion and slap her around and call her stupid. And when he had his life review, when he passed over, he became her. And as he watched himself slap her, he also became her at the same time. So he felt the effects of every slap that ever hit her. He said, Dan, it was like tearing on a piece of paper every time I hit her. I hit myself. And so when Uh he came back from his death experience, he never hurt her again. But she had gotten so used to being slapped that she thought that he didn't love her because he no longer slapped her. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. I know, I think but he said no. One of, I can't do that. Yeah. One of the one of the fascinating things fascinating things about him, um, I found was that he he had total absolute knowledge. He could see your pre- past, present, future. He knew yeah. what you were thinking, like Santa Claus. He knows what you're thinking, and you know, <laughs> good bad or good. Yeah. But but he could not offer information he had to be asked that's right because of free will and and when, gotcha. when he died the first time and he and god communicated he called it superluminal telecommunication that you know it was like instant answer to an instant thought kind of thing and one of the things god told him was about free will tom i think i made a mistake <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah. but it's like the genie's out of the bottle. It's too late now. So w- the reason that Tom came back from the dead was because cause he did not have a near death. He died. He came back from the dead was to pr- try to prevent nuclear war. God said, I cannot interfere in human history because of free will, but perhaps there's something you can do. And, of course, he spent the next more than 30 years doing things to prevent nuclear wars with uh, this country and others as well, I found out later. Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing that I found interesting was he always wore blue. Why? Always, yeah, except the day he was ordained, which blew well, my mind well, that he even asked yeah. to be. A, it, that came after his second death experience. He came and, and uh, he called me and he said, uh, do you ever do private ordinations? Well, he knew that I did not because of ego and stuff, you know. I said, well, I suppose it could be arranged. I had a feeling he was talking about himself, but I couldn't imagine why. And I'm not spiritually Mm -hmm. permitted to involve myself in that decision process, you know. So uh, we arranged that um, he would, you know, be ordained and and all that. But he wore the color blue because from his death experience, he always wanted to honor the Blessed Mother. And so the, the blue color was like the blue vibration. Or of God's feminine side kind of thing, and uh, but the day he got ordained, he had on a white shirt and black uh, trousers and um, no blue. When I picked him up at his house, I thought, huh? I never said anything about, gee, where's the blue shirt, or blue sweater? Yeah. I just figured, well, when I'm, wh- why should I even ask, you know? But uh, that that was an incredible day. That was in the middle of September. I think it was 1991. I don't quite recall right now, but. Uh, 
Lake Ontario was like glass that day. And he said, there can be no witnesses to this. I said, okay. So, and he had driven snowplow all around Lake uh, Ontario. So he knew all the back roads and all that. And so we got in the car and we're headed out. And I'm I'm thinking we need a private location, maybe a, a, a beach area near Lake Ontario. I never said a word to him. He says, oh, what you're thinking about is over here. So we pulled them to uh, Braddock's Bay Harbor, yeah, and parked the car, and we got the implements out for ordination, and we walked down this little dirt path, and around the corner, beneath a gnarly tree, there was a little beach area. There was a, 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 a beach that had happened because the lake is like a soup bowl, and it slops back and forth sometimes, and that area was now uh, sand. So I put the chair down there, and I did his ordination right there, and the same one that everyone's had, since it started, you know, and when I was finishing, there was a bee that uh, was flying above his head. I was trying to get the bee out of the way so I could finish my my thing. And he, afterwards, he said, oh, that bee stung me in my left foot, my right foot, my right calf. And then he picked up his shirt and he showed me where when he had been under the truck and it squashed him, it had pierced his side. He held up his hands and he said, I only need two more. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Honestly, I do not remember how he did this, but he was in the chair, you know, after the ceremony. And I went off to the side. I don't know what I was doing, looking at bushes or something. The next thing I have as a memory is I'm standing on the edge of Lake Ontario in ankle-deep water. And I'm looking out at him, and he's about, I don't know, a quarter of a length or half a length of a football field out on Lake Ontario in ankle-deep water. And, you know, if you've never been through that, you, your mind can't think. You can't process anything. And um, so I'm standing at the edge of the, the lake, and he's out there. He bent over, and he tasted the lake. And he said, oh, there's only 18,000 pollutants in the lake today. It's a good day for Lake Ontario because Kodak <laughs> and Zurich used to dump chemicals in the water and then not be honest about it. You know how it is. And um, so then he said, Chesbo, don't move because there's a broken Pepsi bottle down there by your foot. So I stepped aside and dug into the sand where I'd been standing, and sure enough, I pulled up a broken Pepsi bottle. The top had been broken off, and I would have gotten pretty badly hurt. So I'm holding the bottle in my right hand, and I'm looking out at him, and now I'm trying to justify what I'm looking at, I guess, and um, all I can think of was, well, maybe it's just really shallow here, or maybe he knows where the rocks are, like that old joke, you know. And yeah. then he started walking toward me, and as he got within – a few feet of me, I noticed the only thing wet was the bottom of his pant cuff. He was totally dry. And I gave him some uh, uh, prayer beads, Buddhist prayer beads, and then we left. You know, I went to teach in Denmark, and um, when I got back, I wanted to go to, to, to Braddock's Bay Harbor to wear a bathing suit and see how far I could go into the water. And um, a friend of mine said, well, you know, a lake can be shallow one day and not the next. I said, yeah, I, you know, it's not important. But anyway, uh, I didn't get more than a foot or two into the water, and I was up to my waist in water. And uh, shortly after, he called and said, come for coffee or something. And he said, oh, by the way, am I the only priest who was ever ordained in or on the water? Yeah. I said, yes, sir, you were. Yeah. So, you know, it was something that, just you know, you don't even think about it because you've never seen anyone walk on water. I saw him walk on water, but walk from where he was to me. I didn't see how he got mm -hmm. out there. You know, somebody said to me, "Well, why didn't you ask him if you could join him?" I said, "Because my brain wasn't thinking. You cannot think when you're having that encounter. You know, no. and it didn't seem to be appropriate." But uh, I go there annually, and I go to the spot where we had done his ordination. And just sit and decide to be quiet for a little bit, you know. And every time I go there, Barbara, either a bee or a dog shows up. And he said to me once, he said, you know, uh, I always look through the eyes of a bee or a dog to make sure that you're okay. So oh. and that's, and that's why there's a bee on the cover. You probably noticed that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, when, when somebody goes through that kind of experience, um and has total awareness mm -hmm. or Christ or Christed consciousness or how, whatever right. you want to call it, yep. you kind of think, well, why didn't they come back and said, here, I've been reborn, I have all these powers, and he didn't. 
he mm. he was very humble about it. And very, very. I mean, you know, I'd love to have him on the show. Of course, he's on the other side. But, <laughs> uh, Knowing him, he could probably arrange that. <laughs> In fact, I think you know, he has. I, That's why we're talking. <laughs> well, well, I'll tell you something. I, I can walk on water, but it needs to be frozen. I <laughs> think you and me both, very frozen in my case. I put on a few pounds since the uh, the plague hit, so <laughs> it has to be very thick. <laughs> but 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 you know he had um, such. It it you sometimes wonder if Christ came back today, mm-hmm. what would he be like? And very yeah. much like Tom. Absolutely. Um, in fact, yeah, those know. were his very words at one point, not the end of that, but um, he called me one night. I was up in my room, and I was reading um, a, a book that was about Joshua. And he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm reading this chapter about Joshua. He said, well, that's very interesting. I have a book here uh, that was written with the supposition, what would it be like if Jesus came back? Mm-hmm. He said, can you return this to Sydney, who was the author of his his other book? And I said, sure. He said, well, except for the beginning and the end of this book, this is my story, but I'm not Jesus. Yeah. He said, I, mean, I can be very... because Jesus didn't, yeah. Well, you know, frankly, if I were Jesus, I wouldn't come back either. We didn't treat him very well last time he was here. <laughs> I know. Yeah, who wants to go back to that party? Right. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think so, you know. I no. I did my stint. But but he yeah, I, just I, he had he had such a, an air about him and, and as I as I was we were talking earlier today and he had mm-hmm. spoken at a couple of uh, frontier spiritual frontier fellowship yeah, conferences. Several. I'm pretty yeah. sure I was at the same conference he was at, and I just yeah. now I'm kicking myself. You know why didn't I go to more of the lectures? Um, mm-hmm. But but it's it's sort of like. He he. It feels as though he was very singularly focused. Yes. And so, how did how did he support himself? He had a, his he, day uh, job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He he was a a worker for the town of Greece and doing road repair and water pipe repair and all that kind of thing. And so that's the kind of work that he did. And of course, typical of many municipalities, when it came time for his retirement, they tried to uh, get him out of his retirement stuff. And it was really unfortunate, but it's kind of unfortunately that that it happens to a lot of people. But he supported himself basically by that. Uh, I don't think there was much, if any, compensation for all the times that he gave talks. And he traveled all over and he spoke to groups and uh, churches and and, uh, universities. And uh, for for all the time that he was here, he would retell the story about how he was crushed to death under a truck and all the phenomenal things that happened with that, you know. But, uh, yeah, he he had more knowledge about anything than anybody on the planet and access to it. When he died, he became one with God. He merged and became one with God. So when he came back into that body under the truck – there was more of God and less of Tom. And that was the the mixture that lived here for nearly, what, 40 years about. Uh, And he traveled about. But he had all this knowledge. One of the things he said before he passed the third time and stayed over was, I just feel badly that more people didn't ask me more questions because I had all the knowledge, but I couldn't tell you unless you asked. Well, you know, I think if, you know, if one was sitting back just saying, what if, I can see how God coming back to earth would choose to do it in a very humble way right. and, and and not, you know, come on, with, with politics and, and newscasts and everything the way it is today, his mm-hmm. presence would have been blown out of proportion, he would have had right. no privacy, and he wouldn't have been able to touch the people he needed to touch. And, and this is the only yeah. way it, it could possibly work. And, it, and it, that's exactly how it worked, because although he had all that notoriety and everything, you never saw people outside his house with cameras and wanting to ask questions and, and any of that. He had privacy, and uh, people kind of left him alone. In fact, people said, oh, that's Tom, you know, as far as 
some of the things that he would talk about. But, uh, yeah, and he had a great sense of humor. He was always, you know, sort of cracking things up. But he was very focused on his on his mission, and he did everything that he was uh, sent back to do. He said that he had, that God reminded him that they had a contract, that he would come back from a death experience and uh, with the uh, ability to prevent nuclear wars and to teach people that death doesn't exist and then to help to promote the priesthood because the the priesthood had been somewhat bastardized by all the males who had taken over in politics uh-huh. and all that. So that that was his goal. And before he finally died and stayed over on the third time, um, he had accomplished all that. You know, Barbara, it was amazing because he was born uh, on the ninth month, September, the ninth day of a nine year at the ninth hour at the ninth second to infinity. And that was the value of a true redeemer, a true uh, high teacher. And when he passed, they took him into hospice, and he announced, he carried his own oxygen in there, apparently, I was told. He announced <laughs> to the hospital that he was going to be leaving at midnight. Now, how how would anybody know? Well, he would. you know. So uh-huh. they said, well, put him over in room number nine. And when I heard that, I laughed because that was the complete circle. Yeah. So at midnight he, he passed. Yeah. He just um I can't imagine what it must have I can't imagine what his dreams must have been like. Um you know, because he didn't have an air of I'm better or holier than any of no, you or anything like did. that. No. Uh-uh. He 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 could talk to physicists and yeah. and and you know, anybody and he never he never um he he never said, "Oops, my time is up. I have to go." Um, no. I I know you said someplace in the book that you know people had to be told to you know make sure he ate something and got to the bathroom right. every now and then. <laughs> right. He could talk. The, I asked him once, "How long could you talk?" He said, ten days and ten nights." But I would need some water and have a bathroom break. So when he came to no, Virginia he... to that conference that you're referring to, he talked for three days and three nights. So I told people, I said, bring your sleeping bags and your tape recorders because he will just go on and on, and you'll have to take him to eat or make sure he gets to the bathroom. And so he had a place over by himself, and people stayed there. In fact, a lot of those tape recordings that were used from that talk that he gave were the basis for the book that was finally written about him by Sidney Farr, um, What Tom Sawyer Learned from Dying. She listened to all those audio tapes and then typed up the material and the original book was, my God, like a giant encyclopedia. And the, uh, the publishers wouldn't publish it because it was too fat. It said, you've got oh to gosh. edit this thing down. So um, I worked on the original first book in editing, and there were four others. And you can imagine when you get four different editors, you get four different books. And so oh, yeah. they finally got it down to a size that the publisher would accept. But then I've had friends read the book or try to and said, it's very disjointed. I said, well, what's your problem? Well, what about this? And I said, well, the part that was taken out was da 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 da, da. You know, so, but the information is, is, is there. As he said about Jesus one time, he said, well, most of Jesus in the Bible is, is kind of fabricated or whatever. Uh, but there's enough in there to make the truth work. So, you know, don't, don't worry about it. He said, you couldn't, you couldn't stand, you couldn't, what did he say? You're not able to understand how God produced the energy that that created Jesus. And I thought to myself, who are you to tell me I couldn't understand? But as time went on, I totally (laughs) trusted what he meant because I'm sure there were things that you and I or anybody else would not be able to comprehend. I mean, he he had the ability to teach the the greatest physicists and go beyond them if they knew what questions to ask. He had all the answers. (laughs) The one time, the first time I heard him talk about his death experience, when he told her about being in the tunnel, he said everything was mathematical Uh formula. And I shrieked to myself. I thought, oh, my God, I am terrible at math. I'm notoriously (laughs) bad at math. And I thought, oh, God, I said to him, I said, I'm going to die in Passover, and I'm not going to understand what any of that is. And he kind of laughed and said, well, Dan, for you, they'll probably show you cartoons. (laughs) (laughs) I said, well, that's good. He told me once, he said, you know, you can understand the most complex physics, but you'll never be able to teach it because you can't do the math. But you can take the most complex 
pieces of knowledge and break it down in just a few simple words so that people can basically understand it. You know, that was that was uh, what he what he sensed. But I would sit and listen to him for years, and every single time he told about his death experience, there was always something new. He said he could talk for 10 years nonstop to give adequate justice to just the life review part of it. Yeah, I imagine it must have been phenomenal. And yet, between between his um, his first death and his last, how many years between his first death and his last death? Oh gosh, he died in, in May twenty third, nineteen seventy eight, and then he died again in nineteen ninety one. I think it was. And I don't. 13. You're asking a non-mathematician. You figured out. You tell me. Huh? Oh. Thirteen. Thirteen years. That sounds fun. <laughs> All yeah. right. And, I'm just, and then I'm just it was wondering. another. He he passed in two thousand and seven, which makes a nine. Oh wow. Okay. Right. So uh, and it was the end of April, and it was his wife's uh, birthday. On her birthday. Wow. Yeah. And it was he did that consciously. And he, of course, had a lot of insurance laid for her and all that kind of thing. But she never mm-hmm. really understood who he was or what he did. And and she was like his beard, you know, and he could have like oh, a yeah. quote-unquote normal life and live in the suburbs and appear to be absolutely normal and all that. And and for many uh, who, who knew him, they were never really aware of his extraordinary ability. In fact, I had known him for quite some time and had been through a lot of experiences with him, and I was – almost figuring out who and what he was. And basically, uh, he said to Sidney at one point, he said, if Chesbro doesn't stop figuring out or, or doesn't stop asking questions about who I am, I'll have nothing to share with him before I leave. <laughs> and by that time, I had figured out, no, he's not Jesus, he's Tom. But as he said to yeah. me, he came because Jesus didn't. Yeah, which I think would offend a lot of Christians, unfortunately, but it's what it is, right? Well, I I tell people... Often that the Bible is a is a lovely book, but if you're looking for <laughs> spirituality, just read the red yeah. part. Right. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. But, you know, know, I went seems... to three seminaries, and and they told us in the first one how it was constructed. And of course, I was in a class of mostly men in those days. That's the way it was, and uh, a lot of them were Southern. And had been raised with the idea that the the Bible was God's mouth to someone's ear to a piece of paper. And the teacher said, okay, how many of you speak more than one language? And a half a dozen hands went up, you know. He said, how many of you speak English and your mother tongue? Few hands left. And then he said, okay, are there not words that just don't translate? That you have to approximate because it doesn't quite mean the same or say the same and they say oh mm-hmm. yeah in, in many cases it's well can imagine from the original aramaic or whatever it was to greek to latin to german to french to street slang and what has happened to the the basic information and of course it was 70 years after jesus resurrected that anything was written about him you know oh, yeah and it was like 500 years after buddha died before anything was written about him so you know here it is uh, 2007 to to 2000 and what is it now 22 or something um 22 before yeah. this book came out you know so i thought well i'm going to make the short shorter route <laughs> <laughs> well i think i think you, you did a beautiful job i just you know it's it's there there's so so many questions that kind of flood you with okay he had total awareness yeah how was he not bored um, he wasn't, though. And, Barbara, he didn't dream. You know, in, in fact, he told me once, because he said he knew that I interpreted dreams and all that. He said, Dan, I don't dream. When when he lays down to rest, he just becomes one with God or something, and, and there was no dreaming. Toward the end of his life, he became more physical, uh, normal human being, and then he started dreaming and stuff, you know. But um, in his life review, he's not going to go down a tunnel because – he didn't he's just clear you know express lane right back to the light wow yeah but it was interesting he told me once that he always wakes up at 3 a.m and that's when he does his prayer and his meditation he said dan 3 a.m is when one day ends and another begins 
And I subsequently found out that when the Dalai Lama does his life work, he wakes up at 3 a.m., and that's what he does. You know, A lot of people who are involved in spirituality, 3 a.m. is a wake-up call. You wake up, and it's it's time to, to pray or meditate. <laughs> For me, it's the time to make a pot of coffee. <laughs> that's so weird, because I I wake up at 3, and I, yeah. I accuse the cats of it because they're hungry. <laughs> and so yeah. I do get up and feed the cats and, you know, right. just say, no, leave me, leave me alone. I'm not yeah. done sleeping yet. But but mm-hmm. then I can't go back to sleep. So That's right. Yeah, I leave it, it for at least an hour. Of, yeah. yeah. But it, that's what he would do like, his prayers. He would send out prayers for people. In fact, I, I have to tell you, I don't know if this is in the book or not, but uh, – at one point, his wife got really upset with him because when he would go to sleep, of course, he would go out of his body and go and do his work and leave his, his corpse, if you would, in the bed. And she would wake up and he would be cold. And she was really upset with that. It was very, well, you can imagine, you know. So oh, he yeah. had to promise her, I would not do that again. So he always left enough energy in his physical body in the bed so that she wouldn't be frightened about waking up with him. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I Can mean, you imagine? I would, I'd never go. To, I would never go to sleep if I had that situation. It would be like, you know, I right. no. I, you know, I don't want to. I don't want you to wake up dead. So, yeah. uh, but it, it, it's it just, you know, it, it 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 does blow your mind that that yeah. he had total awareness. Yes. No questions at all. No. And 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 yet, you know, did he have a sense of humor? He had to have. Oh, very much so. Jesus did also. I don't know how much you know about him, but yeah, he had a great sense of humor, and and Tom did as well. He he really did. It was not he never told blue jokes or or anything like that 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 kind of humor, mm-hmm. but just you know everyday common humor things, and he was. He would make little comments about stuff, you know, and um, I can't now remember a single one to, ter- to share with you, but I do remember that about him, that he had a good sense of humor, yeah. If you don't laugh, it's what over, it? I think. <laughs> oh, yeah, and but to be put in that position, um, yeah. now that had to be a contract that he had before he entered into this lifetime. He did, and you know how that happened, at least how he explained it, was when he was dead and one with God the first time, God reminded him of his contract, and he said to Tom, well, if you want to fulfill this contract, then you have to say yes or step to the affirmative, come forward. Otherwise, we'll have to find someone else to do this. Well, Tom said, I don't remember whether I said yes or I stepped forward, but I I merged with God, so he must have you know, step forward. He would joke and say, I was the only man kicked out of heaven. That was one of his sense of humor. He was never kicked out of heaven, for heaven's sake. He merged <laughs> and became one with God, so he had access to all knowledge forever. And and yet when he came back into the physical form, you could not contain total knowledge in the physical brain. So he would say, I desire to know. And then all this information would be available to him about any subject. And that's how he worked it, yeah. Kind of like Google. <laughs> Very much like Google, darling. <laughs> yeah, because there, there was no Google at, when he was here. I, I don't even think we had, had cell phones yet. I don't remember. But, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Anything you want to know, you know, just Google it. <laughs> so, the, oh, Okay, so so he had total knowledge. Yes. And he, but he had to be asked the question in order to bring it forward. That's right. I, he couldn't I just give you the he, answer. I'm wondering if he ever had questions. He did. In fact, you know, when when he died the first time, he had 13 questions, he told us. And because God said, do you have any questions? And he said, yes. And what he told us repeatedly was he had 13 questions. He said, some of which are very personal, so I won't share those with you. But I do remember one of the questions was, did Jesus actually exist? Was he, you know, from Nazareth and all that? And then he said, it was as if I was just a piece of dust on Jesus' shoulder looking backwards, and I could see all of his past lives. Mm-hmm. Mm. 
So wow. absolutely, there is a God and there is Jesus and there are past lives. He said everyone gets to know Christ. He said if you're Jew, you'll go over and see Moses, but then the next person you're going to meet is Jesus. If you're Buddhist, you'll see Buddha, and then the next person you meet is Jesus. You know, so, and it's not that there's a priority. It's all God, but in the form that you had grown to accustomize yourself, but eventually you see through that as you get to the point of clarity to realize that you're only one with God. You can't ever be separated from God. It's just impossible. You can only do it in your mind with imagination, because I asked him once about this. And he said, yeah, you can imagine being separate from God, because you literally can't be. But you can imagine it, and that would be in your mind. But that's the only place in the instant you change your mind, immediately you're back to the reality of being one with God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I... What about past lives? Now, did he have past lives, or you know, did he? Just he did. Come in? He did. In fact, I can tell you that because uh, one time he shared with me. He said, uh, "Do you remember?" And he was talking to me. He said, "Do you remember when we went to Scotland together and we went to to uh, Turkey and a few other places?" I don't have those kind of memories with him on past lives, but I totally trust what he had to say. And of course, he knew about my past lives, and he shared many of those with me as we had been together many times. But, uh, yeah, he was aware of, of some of his past lives. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, oh thank you. I'm remembering now. <laughs> it's funny. I'm talking to you and somebody's talking to me, okay? Uh-huh. <laughs> so been there. One yeah. Of his, one, yeah, we've been there. One of his life review things, not his life, yeah, his life review was when um, apparently he was a contralto, I think, in a choir at a convent or some kind of a monastery or something where Vivaldi, you know, when Vivaldi was born, he was so sickly that his family gave him to the Catholic Church and they groomed him to become a priest, but he was still so sickly that they would never let him mount the altar and serve Mass. So instead they locked him up and he composed sacred music and it was an all-girls school. And so Tom, when he was born in this lifetime, hated classical music. If if his wife had it on the radio, he would yell at her and tell her, stupid, shut it off, you know. But when he came back, it, the radio had come on, and it was classical. And uh, she came, oh, I'm so sorry. He said, no, touch it. That's Joe talking to God, and that's God answering. And Joe was Haydn, Joseph Haydn. Uh-huh. But he remembered Vivaldi, and what he remembered was a, a girl by the name of Felicity, who was in the all-girl choir, and uh, was forced to sing sacred music, and that's why he found a distaste for it. Once that was realized, he didn't find that anymore, and in falsetto he would sing some of her parts, you know. Oh, wow. I know. I know. My, my, late hu- <clears throat> my last husband was a, a biblical scholar, and yeah. um, he he did not believe in reincarnation, and I, of course, <laughs> do. And, <sighs> and so... After after many hours of debate, not fighting, but debate, I right, said, right. okay, look, look, when one of us dies and finds out whether there is or there isn't, they should come back and tell the one that's still here on the planet. <laughs> and, right. And, and he, he said, he said, all right, that's, that sounds good. He, and he said, you sure we can do that? I said, I'm positive we can do that. Right, and right. And so yeah. he, he passed away over 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. I haven't heard from him, so I anticipate that I was right, and he just is too pig-headed to tell me. <laughs> or he's not ready yet. It takes time for some things, you know. The one question I did ask him, because I never asked him hardly any questions, actually, which infuriated my editor. He said, my God, you had access to total knowledge, and you didn't ask any questions. I said, well, what are you going to ask when you're sitting with God, for example, you know. But one time yeah. we were driving somewhere, and I said to him, Tom, about reincarnation, how many years should one take before you come back? And he said, well, Dan, there's no book. Do you remember a book? I said, no. He said, there is no book. There are no rules. He said, you could come back tomorrow, but I wouldn't advise it because you've got a whole life review that you've got to, to look for for making balance and all that. But he said, maybe 200 years your time would give you enough time to do all that. You know, so, mm-hmm. um Yeah. But he's, he talked about reincarnation, and he said uh, that the Buddhists were the only ones on the planet who had a good inkling into what's going on. But he said even they come nothing close to the reality. He said that the greatest part of it is it's pure, unconditional love. It's God, and it's Akasha, and it's all about balance. 
Yeah. So your husband is either <laughs> too stubborn to come back and tell you, as you said, or he's just busy and he hasn't figured it out yet, you know. But, but yeah, reincarnation's a reality. I'm, I'm, I'm so sure of that, you know. But uh, oh yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I know I've been here before. And, oh, I have. And, yeah. And and you know it it's sort of like you know I wasn't Cleopatra or anything like that. But no, but no. It, it, you know there it, it's I I just. And, and, you know, when they talk about old souls and new souls, um, I, I think what they mean is an old soul is probably reincarnated more often than other souls. That's the I only agree way with I... you, because we're all, we're all the same, basically, yeah. There's there's no yeah. higher or lesser, yeah, you're right. But, but you no. know, it's, it's sort of when you have somebody like Tom that you can, you know, sit down with and say, okay, now mm-hmm. give me the real down and dirty, you know. Yeah, like, well, he knew, for example, that when I went to Denmark, I was uh, trying to find any clue or information about a past life that I had there. And uh, I came back because I had found this uh, street corner where I used to sit with my art students and drink coffee and and talk philosophy and all that kind of stuff. Well, when the Nazis invaded uh, Denmark, they came at dawn, and by noon the war was over. They just totally gave up you know but then they went around and they arrested all the intellectuals or those that they thought were intellectuals and took us off to concentration camps so we would be part of the underground and so i was an art teacher he told me this i was an art teacher a gay art teacher and uh when the nazis came they arrested me and i have some dreams about that and they put me in uh, auschwitz and um i starved to death there i died in 1942 and I was born in 1944, so I just I had to come work. I had work to do. I got to go back, you know. But but mm-hmm. he validated all that because as a child I would have these little dreams and things, and couldn't figure out what was going. He said, "Oh, big deal." So you found out that ba 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 ba, you know. But then he verified, you know, what that life had been like. Yeah. And uh, th- I yeah. got to tell you this: it was so because I used to play football. I was terrible at it because I have a depth perception problem, but I did my best. <laughs> and so the drama coach came to my uh, football coach and he said, "Could we have Dan to be in our play because uh, he's taller and he looks a bit older, and we have a part that we like him to, to part to, uh, to play." And so my coach said to me, "Let's face it, Chesbro, you're not very good at football. Why don't you go with Mr. Eartha?" <laughs> <laughs> So I went with him, and do you know what the play was? The Diary of Anne no. Frank. Oh, and wow. And I played Otto. I played Otto. And, and and that stimulated a lot of memories for me about what had happened during those days, yeah. So yeah, and, I got, and it um, just, yeah. Yeah, I, I, know, I know how, you know, those kind of memories hit you. Um, yeah. When, when, the, uh, when the Statue of Liberty was rededicated, um, mm-hmm. My mother and I and my son and some other people went down to the dedication. And coming oh. back, they had they had not put put any extra trains on, so that the crowd was profound. It was so uh. crushing, it was unbelievable. And I uh, looked at the guy yeah. that was standing next to me, and I said, "This is what it must have been like in the boxcar yes. going to Auschwitz." And yeah. and. You know, when when the crowd moved, I moved, and I didn't have my feet down. And I know my my name was Sarah, and I know I passed away at Auschwitz, and I was born in '44. So wow, I came right yeah. back. But, right, um, right. There was there were things to do. Yeah, yeah. And and mm-hmm. you know, it's it's exciting. You know, I I tell people, you know, you're going to experience everything eventually that there is to experience before you're done. Right. And yeah. and and you know if you if you can just check whatever miserable experience you're going through now, check it off, and then you'll never have to do that again. Right, that's your bucket list. And and, yeah. and what I know is that you know God experiences itself through us. So when we've yeah. gone through all these things, God does too. Everything, you know, and that's another reason why you cannot be separated from it. I mean, literally, you're made of God. The entire universe is is unconditional love and neutrinos and all that, and it's all God's space, you know. So um, that that's the greater reality. Unfortunately, on this planet, which is a schoolroom, by the way, um, yes, the, the students are asleep. A lot of them are asleep. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I went to a Christmas Very party awesome. last night, and most of the people in the room were still asleep, which is fine. Lovely people, but no stimulus for conversation as far as spirituality. And this one young fellow walked up to me, and, and the first question to me was, how do you get in touch with your consciousness? And I'm thinking, okay, you know, and so we had a, a lovely conversation, but it was all about spirituality. And he had been studied to be a priest in Brazil. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it is, that's all. It that's, is the, that's the reason I went to the party. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, he yeah. came back totally changed from the first time he died. Yes. And and what must that have been like? I mean, with total awareness, suddenly, you know, yeah. you you look at everything differently. I would think, and yet he seemed to maintain the same routine, the same character, mm-hmm. the same everything. And yep. and so how did he did he just then know that this was he what would he, what he was supposed to do or he, he didn't know how, he just knew that it was going to the opportunity was going to present itself to him. I I'm mean, not sure, honey. I I know that what he said to me one time was, "You know, Dan, I'm just an actor. I'm playing the part of Tom Sawyer." I said, yes, and you're doing a very good job of it, you know, <laughs> because everybody just thinks you're just Tom Sawyer, you know, that kind of thing. But, no, he did miraculous things even with the, the guys that he worked with, and they didn't have a clue to who or what he was. He was just one of the guys, you know. But that that's I mean, how, we, how we did it, and, and no one interfered. I used to worry about him, that some crazy person would come out with a – with a gun and kill him or something and, and think that he was the Antichrist and all that malarkey. And he said, Dan, don't you ever worry about that anymore. That's not going to happen. So he he put my worries aside, and nothing ever happened. He was never accosted or anything. He he came here. He he not only walked on, on Lake Ontario, he sat on the Ganges and prayed and meditated. And then I was told recently that when he went to Tibet on another trip, he walked on the turquoise lake also. Oh wow! Now yeah. I, I do under I do understand what it is like to just know something without knowing it. Right. And right. I understand that, and and I understand how you can be talking and and you'll say something that you did weren't thinking, but it just came out. Right. <laughs> and and every every now and then I'll I'll say <clears throat> if I'm if I'm on a show or something like that I'll stop and say that was pretty I'm going to have to copy that down and you said someplace <laughs> right um, right <laughs> so so I do yeah. understand how being asked a question clicked him into the answer immediately yeah. and and he just had to let it flow so. But this and he did, and his language changed because he had an incredible vocabulary when he was in that mode. I mean, there were uh-huh. words that you'd never hear him use that he would he would use, you know, and uh, and that happened quite often because I would listen to him talk for hours, you know, and um, he, he was just phenomenal with all with all that. I'm sure there's so much more that I don't know about him that I'm still learning you know, uh, from people that did know him or met him, and they've told me some other stories, which unfortunately didn't make it to the book because I just heard him last week, you know, but because uh, <laughs> uh, he t- he touched thousands of lives, millions of lives, and, and he uh, uh, he was on board airplanes when they crashed. He went down with the plane and helped the survivors spiritually and all kinds of things that, that he was capable of doing. But never talked about it. You know, he would he would mention it slightly in a conversation. It was odd because we were in a room full of people, and he talked about something. God, what, I can't remember now what it was, but I heard him say this thing. You know, and later I thought about it, thought about it, and I asked him about it, and I asked other people in the room. No one else ever heard what he said, but he admitted wow. that that yeah that he had said that. So you know yeah. It, it, it was really, I mean, oh, God, I think this is in the book. I don't remember. God, I only wrote the darn thing, but I don't remember all the stories. We, I had a problem here with the well at the farm. It was a, 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 a drilled well, and the, the pump uh, had gone bad, the motor down at the bottom of the well. So he and another near-death friend of mine, Alvin, who's now on the other side with Tom, 
came over that afternoon to help me pull up the well and, and put a new pump on and put it back down. So we did all that. We worked together, the three of us. And um, he was leaving, and I was, you know, saying goodbye to him at the car. And he said, do you remember when we used to sit up on the rafters in that house? Because I bought this whole farmhouse and gutted it, you know. And I would sit up in the rafters and look down to the, the floor and think where should I put windows out, watch where the sun came up and whatnot. Barbara, mm-hmm. I was alone. I had not met him for years yet. But what he said to me was, do you remember when we used to sit up on the rafters and look down? And he drove away, and I thought, later, I thought, uh, okay, you know. I mean, so many things that he did at the time, even years later, when I think about what I watched him do, um, it didn't occur to me that, no, that just can't be done by ordinary people. Like, the first day I met him, we had left the television show, and we were going to Barbara's house for lunch, and we had to take a corner on the right, and we got there, and it had been February snow, so it was a lot of snow up here at that time. And a bus was stuck in the snowbank, a, a regular bus. And he left the keys to the ignition to, to, to keep me warm in the car. He got out of the, the driver's seat, went behind the bus, and pushed it out of the snowbank. Huh. And I watched him do it. And then later he said, oh, yeah, Chesbro helped me push the bus. Well, I don't know what I did, but I certainly didn't get out of the car. But it was years later before I realized I actually did see him move the bus and push it out of a snowbank, you know. And that was the same day that he later talked about how all the dinosaurs died and and all that kind of stuff, long before the scientific community finally came to an agreement about what had happened to to that situation, yeah. He said God had caused uh, uh, a vapor to go around the world. And within 36 hours, all the dinosaurs either flash froze or fried. They died from the uh, the explosions. And uh, except for what could could burrow into the ground, things that were like 50 pounds unless it could get in the ground and, and survive or whatever. And of course, everything that's here now is a is a mutation of that survivor, uh, mm-hmm. the extinction. You know, but it was later documented that. Yeah, there was dust that went around the world. It wasn't a vapor. It was dust. It was called iridium. And it was the dust that was flown up from the asteroid when it hit the Yucatan Peninsula. And uh, you can find it all around the world. You dig deep enough, there's a band of iridium. And below that is a whole age and age and age of of reptiles. Above that, nothing. Nothing at all ever has been found. So, But he he knew all that. Yeah. It is kind of fascinating yeah. because you know chickens are related to dinosaurs, and you don't they you don't are. really even think about that. <laughs> no, they are. It, you know, there was a, 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 a scientist in Germany who got messing with the DNA of a chicken, and he got it to grow a tail and teeth. I said, "Do not breed that thing." <laughs> no. There's a reason why they're not here. Don't bring them back. <laughs> yeah, it got so cold no. that their scales became feathers. Yeah, and that's what they Well, and so, also the, atmos- the atmosphere of the Earth changed, and so mm-hmm. a lot of those birds that flew wouldn't be able to fly today. No, 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 no so none it, of those. It, the pterodactyls are all gone. I mean, it was all it was clear. Clear the deck. We're getting ready to give the humans a crack at it. Yeah, he used to call us uh, puny mammalians with a spiritual inside. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's. it's you know, it's fascinating that, um, you know, here you had the opportunity to ask anything you wanted to, and you, you often didn't. And it, and it's it kind didn't. of like you look back and you think, what was I thinking? You know, here I, I had knew. total awareness. Yeah, sitting right in front of me. But he, and, and, but no. he, he changed, though, between, after his second death. Yeah, yeah. He changed. How did that happen? How did? That... Well, after he told me what happened because, uh, you know, I had gone up the mountain and I kept him here, and then he was sent back by free will choice. He came back, and but God said you won't have all the superpowers that you had before. But Barbara, his abilities had not diminished that much. I could see it, but I felt kind of sorry for him. It's like Superman having to surrender his cape, you know. And he spent the next few years. <laughs> Uh, teaching the priesthood and traveling and, and telling. And, and yet, you know, it's, I couldn't believe it. People would say, oh, yeah, Tom Sawyer, he tells the same old story all the time. What's new? I'm thinking, what do you mean what's new? 
you haven't even digested what he brought back the first time, you know. But he spent the rest of his life, you know, going on to teach and and uh, helped with the IONS organization, International Near Death Studies, and do all mm-hmm. you know all of that phenomenal work. But uh, and he still had a lot of ability, but not not as much as he had before. That's when he started dreaming and, and things. He was becoming more of his human side, you know, when he came back. Well, how did you know he? You know, we we skimmed over it that that you know he prevented um, nuclear wars a couple times. Yeah. How did that? Yeah. How did he do that? Well, the first time that I'm aware that he did it was through prayer. It was in the early years of the priesthood. I think the first year there were only maybe 30 priests that I had ordained by that time, if not even that many. So he said, "Would you all get a hold of them and tell them to pray?" To, to that this man who has the ability to detonate a bomb uh, in Israel, that he won't do it, you know. So we were all praying, but we weren't sure what we were praying. He said, there's such prayer, a power in prayer, you wouldn't believe it. So what happened was there was a guy uh, from the Middle East who was driving a pickup truck, and within that was a dirty bomb that was going to be detonated in Israel. And uh, he was on a mission. And so he was going toward Checkpoint Charlie or whatever, and he said, the guy said, all of a sudden, if I could feel this incredible love go through my body, and I just couldn't do it. And that was all the prayer energy that we were collectively putting together. I'm sure he was as well. So the guy turned himself in, and they dismantled the bomb, and they found the warehouse where the rest of the, the things were being put together, and he dismantled that. And so the first detonation didn't happen. Because in those days, if that had gone on, they would have retaliated, and, and everything would oh, yeah. have just blown up. Yeah. But but that was the first one. And another one was when he um, he sank three ICBMs by loving an electron in the nose cone of the computer. There's seven computers in a nose cone of, a, of an ICBM, I think Tomahawk cruise missile. And he knew that, and God knew it, of course. So what he did when one was being uh, sent in Nevada to a, a, an attack site was he went out of body up here in Upper New York. He went into the nose cone of the missile, into one of the computers, into a plastic part of a computer or whatever, into a molecule of the part, into an atom of the molecule, into the nucleus of the atom, and he waited for an electron to come around, and he sent love to it, and it shuddered. He said, everything responds to love. And it it did a domino effect. He sank three ICBMs, one right after another, because had they flown, they were supposed to be sold to uh, Saddam Hussein at the time. Wow. And so they weren't. So that was another time. Yeah. But he, he did it through love. He did it through prayer. Yeah. Well, it's it's kind of cool, don't you think, that God created everything, and then yeah. and then He created a loophole. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that you know, he he could you know that, that old story about um, oh W C Fields. He was sick in the hospital, and a friend went to visit him, and when he went in to see him, he found W C Fields reading the Bible, and he said. What are you doing? You don't believe in any of that garbage. And and you know, he said you've you've talked against religion and belief and everything your entire life. So what are you doing now? And W. C. Fields said, looking for loopholes. Uh, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. <laughs> but well, he certainly would have uh, known of any. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it was amazing. Well, he said that free will is so powerful that even God won't violate it. So if you're praying for God to say, send me, use me, you all, you've got to ask to receive. Otherwise, it just doesn't happen. Yeah, I think that's the important mm-hmm. thing for people to understand. You know, all you need to do yeah. is ask. And and the yeah. reality, too, is you can ask for um, something, and you can be presented with the opportunity to develop that yes. aspect or that quality. Right. But it won't yeah. be, it, there are no, no silver platters here. No, so no. It, it's a matter of, you know, give give me the opportunity to learn this, to grow, to do to to, to be able to manifest and and I was I was uh, given a gift from one of the ancient Egyptian gods and I'm sure that was just a symbol for God itself, but I was in a dream and and down this uh, long corridor came this short 
little fellow with a golden headdress on and a collar and and he gave me this energy. It was a ball of light that went into my head and he said, there, now you can do things. And then he left and I'm thinking, like what? So this little ball of light that was with me said, well, you can do anything. So look over at that wall and, and think fireplace. So I did it and there was all the shimmering energy and poof, there was a fireplace. But mm-hmm. he said, with this gift is going to come the reality of all the strings that are attached. So you can have what you're asking, but you're also going to know if you get this, this comes with it, or this is because of that or whatever. So there have been several times when I thought about something that I, I would have wanted or something, but the greater reality was, no, that that's really not good for me. So I, I don't need to experience that or have that, you know, but I don't use that willy-nilly anyway. I never have. But, you know, it, it's funny because a friend of mine was talking about desire, and, you know, Buddha said, kill desire. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, well, let's see. You're, you're at a beach, and you've got a beach ball. And the wind comes, and it blows your favorite little toy into the ocean. So you go into the water to get your beach ball. And every time you make a move, you make a wave, and you actually push it farther away from yourself. So stop the desire to have the ball and let the ocean bring it to you. Good story. Good. Yeah, I love that story. Yeah, that's that's good. Yeah. I, I think that <clears throat> so often, you know, we we don't think about the consequences. And no. and I I wrote something uh for the website a long time ago that uh free will isn't free. <laughs> right. There's strings attached. <laughs> oh, you, you have the consequences yeah. of your actions. So, um before you all before to learn you learn from yeah. Oh yeah. I and some I think one I think it was a rabbi at one point that I was talking to and he said that apparently when you're born I I'm pretty sure it was one of the rabbis and he said when you're born you're allotted a certain amount of words for your lifetime. Hmm. So the older you get, be very careful about speaking. You know, ask yourself is this is this worth dying for because uh, when my last word is spoken yeah. I die. Yeah. And and huh. it does it does make a great deal of sense. It I does. haven't quite yeah. put that one into practice yet. I have to get older. I <laughs> Neither have I. Huh? I've got motor mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you think now, by now I'd only have a few words left, but no, that's not the case. <laughs> nah, you know, it's I I find it so exciting, you know, because you never know what's going to happen next. You you really don't, right. and you know I don't want to. You know I. Um, no, people have either. often said, you know, no. do you go for readings? And it's like, no, I like no, a good surprise. No. And and it's kind of like, besides, would I trust somebody else other than myself? No. So, mm-hmm. and that's not that's not arrogance. It's just that no, I know that I that, totally understand. That, yeah. You know that, that that there is, I mean, I can give I can give somebody something that I get, but if they choose, you know, free will. They choose to go another direction, then everything I've said right. is moot. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like it's it's always it's always an adventure. It's always kind of exciting, and I, I think lately I'm saying to myself when things happen, like, okay, what's the lesson here? What what am I supposed to be learning from from this idiocy mm-hmm. that's going on? You mm-hmm. know, and it's it's you never really get it all, but you can get an inkling. Um, now you said that that Tom for his, that prevented two assassination attempts on the Dalai Lama as well. Yeah, um, yeah. How did he do that? It was amazing because I was with him on the first occasion, and we were up in uh, Montreal, and the Dalai Lama was supposed to come there and do some kind of a program and teach the Vow of the Bodhisattva, and, and then there was something that was to be done in this big cathedral. So we all went up and Tom went. And... Um, we, he wanted us to arrive early at the cathedral to get some special seats. So why would you even think anything about that except, well, sure, you know, let's go early and get a good seat. So he specifically wanted us to sit here and here and here and here. So we did, and I was sitting in one seat. My former wife was next to me, and then there was Tom. And we're sitting down, and all of a sudden, in the front of the, of the, the cathedral, this young man walked in uh, in a tuxedo with a a lunch bag, and I'm thinking, oh, there's going to be music, and he's probably bringing a snack. He's going to just wait for everybody to come. Well, he sat behind us a few seats, 
And uh, then I looked over at Tom, and he had a camera in his right hand, and he was, like, holding it like he had a rock in his hand. And he was, like, weighing it back and forth and back and forth. And um, so the Dalai Lama comes in with this entourage, you know, and everybody stood up, and we all stood up. Tom's holding this camera and weighing it. And uh, then they asked us all to sit down. Now, when we sat down, I heard an inner voice that said, if I ask you to stand, stand. I did not know, but at the same time, my wife had got the same idea, stand, because the guy behind us in the tuxedo had a gun in the bag. And what oh he was planning to do was, after everyone sat down, he would remain standing, and then he would shoot the Dalai Lama. So Tom was weighing the camera because when he was much younger, before he had his death experience, so he was born with these abilities. They just didn't happen after the truck. He used to take a rock and throw it at a colored brick on a wall over and over and over. So he knew without any question that when he threw that rock, he would hit the brick. So he was waiting to see at the very last second if that man was going to pull the trigger or not. And if he remained standing and was going to pull the trigger, he would have thrown the camera and hit him in the forehead and probably knocked him out. But the gun might have gone off and shot either me or my my former wife. That never happened. The guy sat down. Wow. I know. The other time he went all the way down, somewhere down south, and... uh, There was a conference going on, and, of course, he was one of the speakers and all that. So he got there early, and uh, he knew the person who was going to come in to make the attempt. And the guy was already sitting there, and so Tom went up to him, and he said, Hey, you know, we're really short some security people here. Would you be willing to volunteer to help us out? And the guy said, Yeah, sure, I'll I'll be happy to. He just wanted to be special. And he diverted diverted him from, from his thinking that his specialty would be doing because he shot the Dalai Lama and so that was the second time yeah it, you know you do you do wonder um when you when you when we talk about um total awareness and and all of that I mean he had a personal life as well as yeah this yeah. spiritual existence yeah he was so, married to two children yeah when when he came in with this gift, um, he became a very special person. And yep. and I think, I, I can't remember how many, it was either five or six, he had said that there are five or six people on the planet at a time that have the same gift. Five. That he five did. resident five? saints, he called them. He said, these are not saints like the Catholic Church saints. These are real saints. And he said there are always five on the planet at all times, and they each cover the whole planet, a domain of the whole planet. They all know each other, but they wouldn't even cross the street to say hello. They don't need to. But when one passes, somebody else is brought in, and they take over that that position. I truly believe he was one of the five when he was here. And we were going to Virginia on a plane trip one time, and I was thinking to him telepathically. I said, one of these people is a woman, and she lives in New Zealand. And he turned to me and he said, yes, that's true, but we would never we would never meet each other. We all have our, our domains. Yeah. But because so, they're here, they, they keep the homeostasis of the planet alive. They, they keep everything in balance so that the rest of us don't blow the whole place up. Well, that's their job. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so this lifetime he was one of them. I truly believe that personally. He never said it, has he, but has the, the he nature did, has, of who he was and when he, I mean, he knew about all airplanes in the air and if there was a problem. And and he knew, you know, what, what uh, was going to crash and he would go there and, and be on it. Uh, there were, I'm sure there are several stories in the book about the plane things, but uh, that was his domain. He, he had North America and all planes, and that's what he was in charge of, yeah. So is this? Has this, was this lifetime the only time he was one of those saints? I, I don't know that. Yeah, I don't know that. Yeah. One time he said to one of my friends about me was what a privilege it was for him to teach his teacher. I don't remember any of that previous relationship stuff or, or whatever. I don't remember when we traveled together in a past life. 
you know, but obviously he's been here before and he's done things. He implied that Albert Einstein was a Christed being. He said, Dan, just think about what he's given to us. You know, yeah. the, the emergence of the nuclear age and, and the relativity, which is still being explored. You know, so many things that just out of one mind came all of this, you know, so it was uh, awesome, you know. You know? Did he ever talk about what he saw for the future? I mean, as, as yes, far as... Yes, he did, actually, and there's, there's light at the end of this tunnel. What he said to me, we were we were traveling somewhere, we were coming back in, in his car, and he said to me, um, there's going to be a lot of uh, turmoil. Uh, it's called the Great Transformation, and a lot of things are going to change. He said the oceans are going to rise 30 to 40 feet globally. And that's going to cause mass migration and a lot of calamity. There's starvation, changing uh, temperatures and climates and all that. But he said all of it is for the good. He said when it's all said and done, um, most of the people here will not be here. They will have gone to another planet. And those who remain are to be the inheritors of the earth or whatever. And he said it will be now called the peaceable kingdom because we will be in harmony with all of nature, with all other beings, and uh, communicate telepathically and all that. So what we're going through, all this calamity, that there's just people shooting people and all this. He told us about that, God, years before Columbine even happened. He said, the time is coming when there are people that are going to walk into a movie theater and open a rifle and, and kill people. And we all thought he was kind of off-center by that time. But then Columbine happened years later, and then, of course, it's almost a daily occurrence now, unfortunately. But what he did say was, I don't think there's been one woman who's been a, a mass shooter. But he said, a lot of these men were raised on Ritalin, and that has destroyed their thought process. Ah. And it's true. I did some investigating sense. with it with a friend of mine yeah. from Sarasota. And the biggest percentage of those who were mass shooters were kids who were raised on Ritalin. He said they're going to shoot their own parents and then go out and shoot the community. But he said all of well. this is called the Great Transformation, and at the end result, we're going to have a peaceful kingdom. It's going to be absolutely like wonderful you know, to, to have all that. But right now, I mean, at this point, the oceans have come up about a foot. And yeah. the scientists initially said, oh, don't worry, it's only about a foot. And then about a year later, they said, I apologize, it's going to be 30 to 40 feet. And when I heard that, I remembered what he told me. He'd gone down to New York City to be uh, interviewed on a program, Good Morning America. And um, after the show, he went up walking around Manhattan. He said, Dan, there were high water marks in all the buildings 30 or 40 feet from the road. But he said, I don't remember when there was a flood here. He says, oh, my God, I'm looking at the probable future. So yeah. any country that, that has a, a, a shoreline, and all, many do, uh, they're coming up. I mean, California can't sink into the ocean. The ocean's going to sink into California. That would make sense. I, I, I jokingly said one day, I'm in Nashville now. I was in Connecticut a couple of years. I, I've lived in Connecticut and on the East Coast right. most of my life. But I'm in Nashville now, and I jokingly said to my son, I could have waterfront property here someday. You never know. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> but, you know, uh, Virginia Beach is supposed to be a, a, a raised-up area because Casey was told that when all that happened, Virginia Beach was going to be fine. And, my God, they're right on the ocean right now. But I guess, you know, the planets can – I mean, the, the land masses can rise. I mean, the the uh, Mount Everest grows so many feet every year, you know, because of the pressure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot's going to happen, you know, and, and we're going to have mass migrations and, and all that. So all the religions of the world are not addressing these these climatic needs. And, you know, it's all about greed and ego. Man, if you're making money with fossil fuels, why should you go with anything else, you know? One more house, five more cars, you know, who cares about the rest of it? But unfortunately, <laughs> we're running out of time. Yeah, it, it, yes. He said, you're going to be lucky if there's going to be air to breathe or water to drink the way you're, the rate you're going. But, you know, uh, a lot of things are changing, but it should have changed 40, 50 years ago. But we're still working at it, and yet there are countries that are still polluting and have no intention of stopping because it's profitable. But, you know, I, I firmly believe that <clears throat> that our country – and I can only, I'll just talk about the United States. I truly believe yeah. that our scientists have 
cured cancer and they have alternative ways of fueling cars and things like that. Right. I, I truly I truly believe that there's a lot of stuff that's already been developed and yet the government is holding them back and buying patents and preventing us from from yeah. moving forward. And yeah. you know, that's politics. That what did he think about that? It, I mean it's politics and it's greed, yeah. Well, when when they discovered neutrinos, he and I had lunch up here in Rochester, and I said, Tom, this is great because there's no difference between you and a rock and a hard place. He said, what, do you want to close the school like planet Earth? I said, well, no, of course not. And then, you know, he he said, well, the whole planet here, the school, is based on love and creativity versus greed and ego, and that split is always going to be here. That's what you come here for. And we can see that so much now. I mean, it's incredible. And, and the hatred and the divisions among the races. I mean, it's pathetic. It's it's skin it's deep, awful. literally, and it's just blatant ignorance in most cases and, and lack of education. And so we're all at each other, and yet scratch the surface. We're all, through DNA, they have proven that the whole human race started in Africa. And then it migrated, mm-hmm. and as it did, our skin color changed the shape of our nose changes, the melanin in our skin, and our eyes turn blue because of lack of sunlight and all that. So, you know, basically, bottom line with DNA, there are people here who still have uh, uh, Neanderthal in there. It shows up in the DNA. They had a special gene that allowed them to survive the last ice age. We didn't have that, but we made it with them, and that's how we got it. So that's why we survived, and they didn't. You know, but oh, it, yeah. it's just one of those things and yet if you told somebody who's a racist yeah well you know in the very beginning you were also black and you had black hair and brown eyes they would be infuriated you know but it's true (laughs) and that when 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 babies are born when they're created we're all female and the clitoris mutates and becomes a penis and that weakens the fetus so when baby boys are born they're weaker than females and then they develop and then they're told all this crap about male supremacy and all that kind of malarkey and they they dominate you know but basically we're born weak and mm-hmm. we're all female to start you know and it's just an amazing thing i remember being in a book club when all that information was coming out and this one guy he was a big ceo of a local company and the news came out that, you know, we were all basically created female and then we mutated. He sat there like somebody had punched him in the gut. And he said, I can't believe that. That can't be true. Well, my God, it's been proven, you know, but he, he wouldn't accept it. It didn't suit him, him, with a capital H. <laughs> that poor boy. Well, I, 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 I worked with a group of people once who were very into – you know, different races, different colors and everything. And, yeah. and you know, who were more intelligent and everything. And I said, uh. I, I said, oh, okay. You know, I said, next week we're going to have a test. And <laughs> and um, this was a spiritual group. And they, they had gotten into this discussion and I couldn't get them out of it. And so yeah. I said, I'm, I, so when they all came in, I had, you know, these ten different um, silhouettes. That, that were yeah. um, up on the thing, and I said, "Okay, now I want you to determine and tell me who's white, who's black, who's yellow, who's brown. Just right. tell me their races." And they all, you know, they they kind of looked at me strangely and said, "Well, you know, we need a little more detail." And I said, "Okay, <laughs> how about if I give you a real good picture of them?" And so I took, I, I turned them all over, and I said. There you go. There's an X-ray of these people, and I said, "Now t- tell me, who's black? Who's white? Who's brown? Who's yellow?" And one of the, one of the men, and I loved him for it, said, "Now how can we tell? How can we tell? You know, the difference because you know we all look the same." And I uh-huh. said, "Exactly." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. And it was it was that was good. It was sort yeah. of, it was yeah. it was it was great, you know. They all look the same. I said they are all the same. Yeah. And we all a are lot the of same. it changed though. Yeah, it needs to change a lot more. But 
I never thought in my lifetime that I would see all kinds of things changing as much as I have in terms of acceptance and all that. Even you watch a Hallmark channel and now there are interracial couples, there are same-sex couples and all that. That never happened even two years ago. That's true. You know, it's it's really cool. You know, there was there was a guy way, way back before a lot of this started who died while they were doing an X-ray of him. He was in Second World War, I think. Uh, I forgot the guy's name right now, Pooh. But anyway, um, when he passed, uh, he had three questions from God before he came back. And it's after you've had your life review and all that. And three questions were, what did you do with the life I gave you? Not in a judging way. Look, I'm making universe. What are you making? Show me. What did you do with the life I gave you? What did you learn? And what did you love? And based on those three things, you evaluate your last life and then you create the next one. And I said, just stop and think about those things for a while because it's going to really shake you up. So, you know, just I think the most powerful three, so I always try to mention them when I'm teaching. What did you do with the life I gave you? There's no judgment. God will only love you. God's an unconditional lover. You cannot violate God or separate yourself from God. And God's a part of the experience. So what Mm -hmm. did you learn? Well, you've been divorced twice. You haven't failed. What have you learned? You know, and what did you love? Because most people don't even love themselves, forget anything else. And that, that's not a value judgment either. Just you're, what did you love? Did you love yourself mm-hmm. as I do unconditionally? Or are these conditions, not until I've gained weight or lost weight or changed my hair or whatever, then I will be, God says, no, I love you just the way you are. You're perfect. I had a lady yeah. come to me recently and, and she was on the phone and, and you and I shared this earlier today and she had been reading uh, Conversations with God and the very first book talks about how magnificent the soul is and everyone's perfect which is what Tom used to say and mm-hmm. at the end of the conversation she said, well, I'm going to bed soon but I, I'm, I'm not perfect I said, what? I said, didn't you just tell me that you read all those books over and over and over and you you come up with that? I said, when you go to bed tonight, you lay down and you say, I am perfect, and thank you. Give gratitude, and then go to sleep and see what happens. You know, you'll have a whole different life when you wake up, even when you go to sleep, you know, because most people say, oh, nobody's perfect. No, that's not true. Everyone is perfect. Everything is perfect. It's just the way it is, and it's the way it is because of all the free will people thinking it that way. You know, so we can change everything if we all collectively have you know, a thought for balance or whatnot, but overcoming all of our prejudices and, and likes and dislikes. They're skin deep, if that, and it's political BS and everything, but, you know, there's a way through it, and it's about about loving yourself first. And, you know, that's that's as old as the hills, but it still isn't appreciated, you know? Yeah, that and a sense of humor. Um, oh, right. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has- said to me once, Barbara, they said, when you look in the mirror, you can hear God laugh. You know, God has a sense of humor. After all, look at us. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. No, it's, 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 I think people don't, you know, understand the true value and worth of laughter and joy. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and you know, somebody, every Thanksgiving, my my grandchildren put questions under everybody's plate to ah. um, and we we answer the questions after after we eat. And um, mm-hmm. my question one year was, you know, what would you change about yourself if you could change anything? And I, you know, I mm. I thought and I and I said, you know, everything that's happened to me to this point in time has created the me that I am today. And I really like who I am today. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't change I wouldn't change anything. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> you know, superficial mm-hmm. stuff would be fine, but 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 every experience just just yeah. gave me a greater depth of understanding. Right, and one thing leads to another. Yeah, they're all connected. Oh gosh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you so get to see that when, time. When he made his his second death, what was his second death? We've talked uh, about the it. surgery, the back surgery. Oh, okay, surgery. Yeah, and, the first one so, was under the truck, the second was the back surgery. And the third one, he had gotten ill from all his efforts and whatnot, and and uh, he went into hospice 
somebody went with him, and uh, that's when he told them he was going to leave at midnight. Wow, that's yeah. I mean, oh, that, I didn't tell amazing. you this part either. I I was teaching an ordination class around that time uh, later, and uh, one of the women in the class was a nurse, and she said she was supposed to have been on the floor that night when he came in, but she had something come up, so a friend of hers went. Uh, and took her place, but she told her that Dan Chesbro was there when he passed. I was in Utah. Huh. I was in Utah. And then, uh, in, in fact, I woke up that morning, and I'm, I'm laughing to myself. I said, okay, I'm here ordaining Mormon women into the order. <laughs> That's totally antithetical to their whole thing, right? And... Uh, then I talked about Tom Sawyer, and so in the morning, Spirit said, oh, why don't you talk more about Tom today? I did not know he had transitioned the night before or graduated, as as he would say. You know, so I, yeah. I did, and I got home, and I had a message on my voicemail thing that he had uh, graduated, you know. I've never felt sad. I mean, it would be great to be able to drive uptown and see him, you know, but uh, now he's not in any kind of pain or harassment or whatever he might have gone through. And he's free, and he still comes to me. He comes to my dreams, and we talk. He still shows mm-hmm. up at a, like a bee and watches over me and stuff, or a dog, you know. So, And I, I asked him once, I said, will I hear from you when you're gone? He said, oh, yes. He said, I'll, I'll come and talk to you in, in your <laughs> dreams and stuff. So he, he's taught me some wonderful things, and he, shows, he still shows up. Every single time I've gone down to where he'd walked on water, either a bee or a dog shows up when I'm, when I'm there. Every single time. That's, that is really cool. It's now, really with, cool, with, yeah. With all the wisdom and knowledge and power, because he was able to bilocate, did he ever Multiple do healing? Locate, darling. He did beyond bilocate. He could be in every place at one time. In fact, I realized that more and more as time went on, <clears throat> he tells a story about a plane crash where this guy was driving home uh, to work in his truck, and the last thing he saw was a big tire come with a wind chill. Now, I told that story, and I never realized. The only way Tom could have known that story is if he was with that man in that car. Because mm-hmm. at the same time, he was also with everybody in the plane when the plane was crashing, because he helped them. We watched a movie that Jeff Bridges made several years ago about a plane crash, and that was based on this uh, this event in a way. And he he was crying while we were watching the movie, and he said, Dan, that's exactly what it was like. That it's not the same fuselage or whatever the the engine. I mean, not the engine. The inside of the plane was. But he said what was happening was exactly what was going on when the plane went down. And and I think this story is in the book. There's another uh, a, a, a group of terrorists that had commandeered a plane. And they wanted some of their their people released from the uh, Israelis. And so they said, well, we're going to shoot everybody on this plane until you give us what we want. Of course, they won't compromise. And so they started shooting people. They molested them. They beat them. And they found out if they were Jews. And then they shot them in the head and pushed them off the plane. Well, this one woman was watching this. And she thought, well, my God. Because she watched a woman get shot. And then she kept, like, quivering. And they went down and kept shooting until she stopped. She said, if I get shot, I'll pretend to be dead. And so they called her up, and they shot her in the head. The bore, the bullet acted like a cork in the back of her head. They pushed her off onto the tarmac, and she pretended to die. Now, when she did that, her grandmother, who was on the other side, showed up and asked her to come. And Tom was here in Rochester and in the plane. He said, Dan, I walked up and down the aisles of that plane. Only one person asked God for help, and it was that woman. She was from Minnesota. And he was the only uh-huh. one she could help. Yeah, but the instant she decided to stay, he took off. I don't have to stay here. She's fine. And she went through a lot, but she eventually, you know, recovered and all that. She was on the Donahue show with him, and she didn't know who he was. I mean, he was invisible, but she kept feeling yeah. his energy. And she was on a panel, and she kept saying to Donahue, isn't that guy wonderful? Isn't he great? You know, and Tom was sweating because <laughs> he thought she was recognizing him. I said, what was the problem? He said, well, she prayed to God, but she got me. <laughs> right. Ah. So he was afraid that would destroy her her faith in God if she realized that Tom showed up and not God, but God was working with Tom. You know what I mean? So. Uh mm-hmm. huh. Did, did yeah. he ever do healings? I mean. Uh yes, yes he did. Um. Nothing, nothing that you could blow a trumpet over, but he 
did a lot of work. Uh, he went to a hospital once. It, well, it was kind of a healing in a way. This this young man was passing, and Tom went to be with him. And uh, the guy and his sister wanted to see each other one more time, you know, but he wasn't going to live long enough. So Tom asked God if the man could stay in his body another couple of days, and it was granted. So the sister finally showed up. She saw her brother. They said their goodbyes, and he took off. Years later, um, I was teaching in, in um, where was it? Indiana, Mississippi. No, it wasn't Mississippi. It doesn't matter. I was teaching somewhere, Michigan. Uh -huh. And uh, this woman showed up, and she said, oh, I heard you talk about Tom Sawyer today. Well, I met him. I said, oh, really? She came in for reading. I said, well, how did you meet him? She said, well, my brother was sick in a hospital. Huh. And I couldn't get there. There was a problem with the plane, but I got there a couple of days late, but it was just, just in time to say goodbye to my brother. And I said, honey, what you don't realize is that Tom – kept him here long enough so that you two could say goodbye. And we both wow. cried. Yeah, oh, I know. Yeah. So in a way that was like a healing because it was for the two of them, you know, and the guy was, was it was his time, you know, but, but Tom did ask God to intercede for that that situation. Yeah. It's amazing. I think probably, probably part of what protected him from a great deal of notoriety was the fact that he didn't do healings, that Right, right. Now, he didn't sit around and, and there were hordes of people waiting with broken parts to fix, you know. But, um, yeah. you know, he, my, my youngest daughter is deaf in one ear. And uh, my former wife was taking her to Filipino healers and all that stuff. And, and she didn't want to go. She, she cried. She said, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And so she called Tom. She said, Tom, can you help me with this? And he said, put Patty on the phone. He said, Patty, I love you just the way you are. If you don't want to go, then don't go. And he told Carol, she doesn't want to go. Don't go. Yeah. And she didn't. And she still has her deafness in the one ear. And then genetically, we found out that my grandson has the exact same uh, hearing problem. So she wasn't healed, but the healing was her accepting of herself and being okay about taking her power back when it was in a situation where she was supposedly going to be healed by these Filipinos. And, and uh, But it's her perfect gift. Do you know, Barbara that that deaf ear is the one she could hear out of when there were whales on the ocean. She knew how many were in the pod and when they were coming up. How cool is that? So what's deafness, so she really, right? So really, it's, it, she wasn't deaf. She just heard uh, a different No, she frequency. just had a different range than the rest of us, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Kind of like cats, you know, cats and dogs, they hear at a different level, too. So, they do, um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, how cool is that? That's yeah. No, I, and, I have a partner that lives with me, and, and the cats know when he's about five miles away. They all go to the door, and they look up the driveway and wait for him uh, to come home. Yeah. I could be here all day long. We've got five. I could be here all day long, and I might see two of them all day. He walks to the door. They make a beeline to the kitchen. They all meet him there. <laughs> I said, you're the, you're the Pied Piper of cats. That's what you are. <laughs> uh, he's probably the one that feeds them, too, so... Um, he started to no, do that. Yeah, he, he's been doing. I usually do it, but, but yeah, he he's really helps that way. You know, they feel his energy, and and my daughter Patty's the same way. She walks in the house, all the cats show up. They just adore. Her, you know, so. That he is told so a cool. story once. I I don't know that this is in the book, but there was a, a lion somehow that ended up in somebody's garage. I don't know how these things happen, but supposedly he walked in and talked to the lion and, and got it ready to be taken back to wherever it needed to be. And and he would be outside, and there would be a pasture nearby. The horses would run to the fence because they wanted to be close to him. When he sat on, on, the, on the Ganges River, there were wolves running back and forth on the shore on the opposite side because they knew that his energy was close, and they just didn't dare go in the water to go and meet him. But they wanted to be close, and the fish in the water sensed him and all that. It was just, you know, an amazing situation, you know. How but, yeah, you know, my, it, it it seems it seems remarkable that he kept his humility and with he all did. of that going he on. He really did. Yep, he really, really did. Yep. Like, he never bragged about anything or whatever. He he talked very openly about a lot of things. Uh, he had a personal life, and that kept personal, you know. But it was also his cover. It made him appear to be normal. You know, so, mm -hmm. uh, but he had a mission and he did his mission. 
He said, nobody leaves here until their work is done. Nobody, whether you're a second old or you're 105. So when he finally wrapped it up and, and left, he was finished with his work. You know, and I recently had a, a, an experience by my pool and I was falling. And if I'd fallen a little further to the front, I would have been probably killed. And I fell backwards and I slammed the deck and cracked ribs and all that. And before I hit the ground, I screamed to God and Tom and I said, no, I'm not coming. You know, <laughs> nobody was around. There was no, this is early morning. Nobody was around to hear that. And they took me to the hospital and uh, the nurse that was attending me, out of the blues, well, well, you know how it goes. She said to me, mm -hmm. um, you know, I had a near-death experience. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm lying here in agony, thinking I might be paralyzed at any moment, and yet you're going to tell me the story. So she said, yeah, I work at the hospital, and I, I know all the <laughs> nurses and the doctors here, and they they took me in for some surgical thing, and I died in the process. And I got out of body, and I could hear everybody talking and what they were planning to do and all that. And, of course, they brought me back, you know. But she said, nobody in this hospital will tell me the truth. She said, they all say, no, no, no. So she went to the doctor, and he said, uh, you, can't, you can't know that. You were dead. So I reached up, and I touched her. I said, honey, it's going to be okay. You're not the same woman you were before, are you? She said, no, I'm not. I said, it'll be all right, yeah. you know. It, it, it's okay. But I thought, you know, you can't tell me that I had to body slam in order to meet this woman, but that was all part of the deal. Well, months later, Tom shows up in a dream, and he says to me, Chesbro, I gave you a chance to leave, but you yelled and screamed, and you said no. Ah. Well, it, it's funny. When I was much younger, um, I already had my son, so I was maybe 30. And yeah. uh, I, was, I was diagnosed with um, severe ulcerative colitis. And oh. after they did all their tests, they told me I was going to die of it, that there was oh. just no no way. And, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm sitting there in the doctor's office, and they're saying, you know, you should get your, your act together. And, and and they said, you you know, you don't have long. And I looked at him, and oh. it, it was so un unlike me to say this, but I said, I can't die. I have too much to do. Right. I'm not dying. That's what I said, yeah. I said, and the book and isn't done yet. he looked yeah. at me and he, he looked at my mother and he said, you know, maybe we should give her some, you know, something for this, you know, this this frame of mind. And my mother <laughs> said, no, she'll be okay. And so here I am, at least, right. you know, fifty if not yep. sixty years later, and mm -hmm. um, there is absolutely no sign of having colitis. No. And and you know, and I just I I, I every now and then send a card to the doctor and said, just how long did I have? Hey, you guess know, what? I mean... <laughs> I'm still here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah on, right. on the back of the Tom Sawyer book, there's a quote from a woman by the name of Mary Grace. And uh, can you believe the publisher asked Tom in spirit what he wanted on the back of the cover? And he said, I want Mary Grace's comment in there. So they put it on the back of the book. Mary Grace is a friend that we met at the gym because she had bumped into Tom and then she found me and she said, are you Dan Chesbro? I said, yeah. And then she told me. And so we've gotten to be pretty close. But she was a drug addict. She was uh, an alcoholic. She had a hole in her heart. She had lupus. And I forgot what other, other things she had wrong with her. But she was going up to Rochester on 390 to make a drug deal, which she did do, she told me. But on the way home, all she heard was a clap of thunder. Next thing, she wakes up in a parking lot sleeping in her car. And she doesn't know how she got there or whatever, but uh, she went to a doctor a short time after. And he said, oh, my God, oh, my God. The hole in the heart was gone. The lupus was gone. The, the need for booze was gone. The need for drugs was gone. She was totally clean. She said, when I died, I met the boss. I met God. And God said, Mary Grace, you can't stay. You've got work to do. You've got to go back. Ooh. <laughs> I know. I know. So, you know, and, and that's the story he wanted on the back of this book. So they did it. That that amazed me that a company that big would talk to somebody not in a body. I don't know how that was done. I never asked but that they said, no, Tom wanted her, her on the back of the book. So there she sits. Yeah. How very cool. I know. Well, it's you know, incredible. He, well, it's not he, incredible. He, it's incredible. Yeah. Well, yeah. And the thing is, you know, what do they say? When, when you've exhausted all your possibilities, then the impossible is probably the reason. And, <laughs> and uh, 
<laughs> and, and so, you know, just having, having, I mean, the book is fabulous. And, and you know, before we get too much further, I do want to say to people, this is a book you just, how can you not read this book and be impressed? <laughs> and, yeah, and it's amazing, yeah. It's, it's all on stories, Amazon. Barbara, every one of them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And mm-hmm. and the book is on Amazon. It's on my website under the What If. P, uh, P, there's a connection there for the uh, for Amazon. There, you know, it's 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 worth reading. It's inspirational, and it gives you a whole other take on so much in life. And it, it doesn't yeah. conflict with anything. It doesn't matter no. if you're religious or not religious. This is something that a man, a, a, a normal kind of man experience uh, uh, uh. Yeah. and and you know it it it's a wake up call to a lot of us that that um yeah. magic happens and and you know paying attention to coincidences and and you know asking and be re- and being responsible for your actions i mean all of it is so simple mm-hmm. and and it you can know, er- change earlier the world. today you and i were having some conversation and you mentioned that some of the priests were going to be probably listening to this but thinking well gee i was ordained but i haven't done anything with it and i i later i thought to myself well that's just not true because you go to sleep at night everybody does for the most part and then you go to work 24 7 you know so you might not be consciously awake running a hospice program or doing this or doing that or but you go to sleep at night you do suicide rescue you teach classes so the the commitment is to service and so everybody who's been yeah. ordained is in service, you know, whether they're still here or they're on another dimension. You know, they're always working. So, yeah. This has been a great opportunity, Barbara, and I, I thank you so much for for uh, mentioning the, the book and the things that we've shared today. It's been really fun to be with you again. Well, you're going to come back and we're going to do the um, Priesthood of Melchizedek book. Yeah, and, um, yeah that, that's a great story. <laughs> Yeah, they all are, and and the thing is, I I think it's important for people to understand that that nobody is normal. Everybody is extraordinary. Everybody and, magnificent, yeah. And and so you're you're teaching, you know, <clears throat> being out there and being kind to your fellow man is a ministry, and mm-hmm. and so you you don't have to have a degree, and you don't have you don't have to be no. an exception have an exceptional job you can just be joyful and kind and loving and and there there's your ministry and make and, yourself and, the priority you know when it comes to love you know i used to oh, say to yeah. people what are you giving yourself for christmas or the holidays well, what do you mean i've got all these gifts to buy for well, what what about you are you not important put yourself at the top of the list you know so i used to do that my kids would say dad we were going to do this for you. I said, I, I got to beat. I did it for myself. I deserved it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. it's just, it, it's, it's been good. such a pleasure. And I, I so look forward to having you back. And again, oh, the I book is on Amazon, too. folks. Yeah, we'll have, yeah. We, we got more stories to tell. That's for sure. Oh, we sure and... do. Lots. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, but, honey, you know, and, and the other thing, too, is if, and I'm, I'm sure you'd say this, that if people listening have any questions, have them send them to you, and maybe we can use that for some of the source for answering questions, too. That would be that would be fun to do. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and yeah. thank you so much for taking taking the time to spend hours with me. and, and Oh, and I've, I've enjoyed every minute of it, yeah. yeah. Well, you're responsible for a lot of it. You, you gave me the <laughs> kick in the butt. And um, I took it from there. Yeah, literally, yeah. Because that's what, you know, when when you get ordained, the energy goes down and is the kick in the butt to the kundalini, to the root chakra, and that's what starts your enlightenment. And I tell people now when I'm teaching the class, I said, well, uh, you're on your first way to Buddhahood. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) This this life or next, you never know. That's right. But... So enjoy it. Have a good but time. If you're not doing, if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. So have a good time. Yes, exactly. So I <laughs> want to thank you for being here and sharing your time with me. I will oh, get welcome. this up on YouTube and and uh, I'll send you the link so you can share Wonderful. it or not, That's whatever great. is appropriate. Yeah. Okay. And 
Thank you again, and I will be in touch with you, and we'll figure out when next you're going to be Please on. Please do. I, I, it'll be a pleasure. I look forward to it, Barbara. Take care now, and thank you, and good night. Good night, honey. Good night. Okay, everybody, that's it for us for tonight. Um, next Monday we'll be back, and this show will be up on YouTube tomorrow. And like I said, this is a book that you can't afford not to read. It's 100 pages. And it's full of magic and and joy. So good night, and I will be seeing most of you again uh, next week.